I would mostly urge people to listen to sort of listen to what they're feeling as they're as they're working on something if if that something is boring you if it's frustrating you if you're just trying to like sort of blast through it to get to something else you know just i think listening to those feelings is is pretty important welcome to the passion behind the art show it's all about diving in with individuals to learn the awesome story behind their passion it's your host daryl pinnock enjoy this week's episode you know well i'm super excited to have nick masani on the passion behind the art show i'm kind of stoked about this uh he may not know but uh we're fellow new yorkers uh, oh, so, awesome. uh, it's super cool to have him on here nick welcome thank you i'm so happy to be here thanks for having me awesome man awesome awesome so let's kick it off how did this journey start for nick uh, this design journey. Uh, I, well, my so I grew up in a in a small town in Italy, uh, right outside of Milan, and uh, my my mom was a uh, a studio art jewelry major uh, in upstate New York, and she moved to Italy uh, right after college, and she met my dad, who was a jewelry designer as well, and uh, and ended up staying in Italy, where she where she had me. And so I grew up sort of around jewelry design, not exactly the same, but mm. still it was like a design family for sure. My, both my parents, uh, you know, collected a lot of great uh, art and furniture. So that stuff was around. Um, I loved to draw when I was little. Uh, and then my, my father passed away when I was quite small, but my mom uh, stayed with the jewelry design and, um, and continued working for his company. So uh, I, when I went to high school, and actually I think here we have a bit in common because I studied architecture as well uh, in high school. And uh, it was actually an architecture and industrial design program in Italy. We have specialized high schools. You sort of have to choose what you want to do right after middle school. So I went to this uh, architecture program for five years and uh, after I graduated, I decided I didn't want to do architecture or uh, industrial design or anything like that. I moved to the States for college at that point. I was 19. I had lived in Japan for a little while, so that was also like really awesome. Uh, and in college, I, I pursued something totally different. I, I majored in music and then eventually made my way back to design after college and I had always kind of done it on the side mm. like for small like family events I might do an invite uh you know your basic like label for uh your grandfather's dried sage or whatever it was you know like uh, so I was always doing that stuff and I never really I don't know I never really I, I I knew it existed as a profession I just didn't think I was into it I was never really into the idea of making business cards and websites and stuff like that. And, and I thought that was the entirety of, of, of graphic design. So, um, so when I eventually discovered graphic design right after college, when I realized that I really couldn't make much of a living from classical music, mm -hmm. I, um, I went to Pratt for grad school. Cool. So... That's sort of where my formal training started. I didn't do any type and lettering stuff there. I did, well, I primarily got the basics of sort of design, but more on the kind of conceptual research-based stuff. So I start, lear, sort of learned how to think about design, cool. which I, I sort of hated at the time, but now I can, I can see why it was useful. Um, but yeah, so I, I learned about... Uh, Luis Feely's work when I was in grad school and that was sort of my my in to lettering cool 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 so um do you actually play an instrument <clears throat> yeah I I studied as a um classical harp major oh cool harp you yeah. don't hear that every day no <laughs> no you don't um it's kind of an unusual instrument it's uh <clears throat> It's pretty large. I don't know if you've ever seen one yeah, up I've close in person. Yeah, they get really, really huge. Um, 
but I loved it. Um, I love the complexity of it. I loved the kind of ornamental quality of it, which I see coming back over and over, even with my, my visual work, you know, I've always had an interest in ornament and in the sort of the crafts of, of the past. So I think that was apparent even when I was doing music, even though I wasn't really aware of it. I mean, it kind of makes sense, especially with the jewelry background. Yeah, um, in, in retrospect, yeah, it, I guess. It, yeah. it just all kind of ties together, because if you think about it, the tiling, um, the tiling type of design, if you really think about it, jewelry has some concept of um, tiling, mm -hmm. too, when it comes to jewelry. Sure, yeah. yeah. So, but even just this like interest in like decorative art right, and right. and stuff like that, you know, I, jewelry is definitely a decorative art, and um, and and obviously mosaics, but also the other stuff that I've been interested along the way, and that I continue to be interested is kind of within that that field. Okay, so are you are you and your mom like still pretty close and all that stuff? Yeah, it's funny you should say that because she, I just got a notification as we're speaking that she's calling me and and she's like, you can't talk? What's happening? <laughs> like, yeah, I forgot to tell her this was happening. Um, oh, but yeah, okay. we're very, very close. Um, you know, when she was a single mom, obviously, like I said, um, and I had a, I have a little brother, so that environment um, kind of, uh, I guess it could go either way, but in our case, uh, it, it made us all very, very close. Um, and yeah, so she's 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 great. Uh, she's still she's still very artistic and creative, but she doesn't she doesn't really do much of the jewelry stuff anymore. Okay, cool, cool. So how did so basically you came to New York for school? I did, yeah. I studied the music school was in upstate New York, so it was still New York State, mm -hmm. but I moved downstate. Um, for, for grad school to study design. And um, since I graduated grad school, you know, I've just been here ever since. And that's at this point, like seven years ago, which is crazy to think of um, that I've been doing this for, for that long. Actually, I moved down here seven years ago. I graduated like five years ago or something like that. Okay, cool. I left in New York seven years ago. Oh, no yeah, way. So yeah. our paths crossed. Yeah, Where did you yeah. live? I lived kind of all over the place, but I lived in Brooklyn. The last place I lived was in the Bronx. So uh, most of my oh, years, okay. most of my years I lived in Westchester County though. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah it's yeah. really nice up there. Yeah. Yeah. It's nice. Very nice. So it was just kind of cool to, I'm always, I still consider myself a New Yorker, even though I've been in yeah, Georgia New a Yorker long time. Yeah. New Yorker for life. Yeah. yeah. It's like one of those things, like it's kind of like a fraternity. You're from yeah, New York, you're from sure. New York forever. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, <laughs> Kind of talk to me about who um, kind of pushed you during this journey, um, who you kind of pull energy from, those people that, you know, you call your support system. Yeah, uh, that's such a, it's a great question because there, there are so many different people that fill that role for me. Uh, I mean, there's people who support me on a personal level um, and, 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 you know, I do need a decent amount of support, I have to say. Like, I... Uh, I do lean on my friends and I lean on my partner a lot. And uh, obviously, like my, my mother, we're close. So we talk a lot about design and about my own insecurities around design and where I see my, my career going or not going. Uh, but professionally speaking, Luis, my former boss, is still has a, still a, a fairly large role in my life. Uh, she's We stay in touch and she's still endlessly supportive and uh always encouraging and she was this way while I was working for her but she remains this way even now that I've left so I would say personally yeah my mom my partner and professionally Luis and I have I'm fortunate that I have a, a few not many but a few really really good really close friends that are designers and I really cherish those friendships as well yeah that's cool it's cool to have that support system because I don't think people understand, but design can be a very lonely... Um... Oh, for sure, yeah. yeah. Freelance design, I'm <laughs> learning now. You know, this is still very new for me, but I'm learning that it does get very, very lonely, especially in a city like New York, where, like, it's, you know, there's so many people, but it's still a pretty, can be a pretty lonely place. Yeah, I can't wait to get into that even more. So, yeah, I know it's not, I know you probably, as soon as you started out, you had it all together, you had it figured out, 
you're on top of your game <laughs> from the beginning. Right. Yeah, but just in case, just yeah. in case, what would you say was the biggest struggle you had to overcome? Hmm. I think uh, probably uh, boredom, maybe, um, was the biggest struggle for me. It's I have never had a terribly hard time of it. Um, I did work really hard to get to a point where I more or less enjoy what I'm doing. And I'm fortunate that I have work and I've never really had to, uh, not have work. For, I've never had a really a dry spell, but you know, I've just, I've just started. So we'll see how that goes. But I have struggled with getting to a place and then enjoying it for a while and then getting bored pretty quickly. Mm. So uh, I'm I'm pretty uh, I'm pretty goal driven. I'm I'm motivated by goals. So one of my first goals as a designer was to work for Louis, and uh, it took two and a half years of and several attempts to get there, but eventually it happened. So. Once once it happened, I, I enjoyed it for quite some time, but then dealing with those feelings of maybe restlessness and wanting to continue to explore things and maybe feeling myself getting into a rut, despite yeah. having this great job, you know, this feeling of guilt around mm. like, well, I have this great job. Why don't I appreciate it more? I have this great boss. That is really all I could ask for in a boss. but. Right. Uh, why do I still, you know, what else is out there? So, and I, I would like to think that that was sort of a, I could tell you that that was a, a natural transition and I was just like, okay, it's time to move on. But it, it did kind of, uh, it kind of got me down for quite a few months. Wow. Just this feeling of like not, uh, not in, not enjoying what my personal work was and feeling bored by it and doing kind of the same old, same old at home. I'm not really, I wasn't really as concerned with the fact that I was doing a certain type of work at the office because that was the work of the studio, which I happen to like also. But when my own personal work started like feeling a little bit boring to me, then I knew that sort of I had a problem and I had to like switch something up. So talk a little bit about what did you have to do for two and a half years to, to kind of get on board? Oh, to, to start working for Louise? Yeah. Uh, well, the first, so the first time I reached out, I applied for a job with her. Uh, I was right out of graduate school and my portfolio was full of this like really conceptual weird stuff that I wasn't really believing and I, I didn't feel strongly about. I had done a little bit of lettering on the side that mostly because I wanted to get better so that I could work for Louise. And at the time I thought it looked pretty good, but, uh, you know, even just after a few months, I, I realized how bad, how bad it was. And she was really gracious and, and patient, but obviously it wasn't going to be a good fit. I was like way too green. So I signed up for this, uh, two week, workshop that she teaches in Rome. She teaches a typography workshop every year through SVA. And uh, it's it's quite expensive. And I had to sort of really budget for that, which wasn't easy since I had just graduated and I had a ton of debt. But I thought it would be a good, a good opportunity to study lettering in a more formal setting so, since I didn't really have the chance to do that at Pratt and also obviously get to know Louise and get to know what her taste is like and how she works with people and, and evaluate if that was going to be a good fit for me. So it ended up, I ended up really liking it. And I, I felt like I, I had this, uh, we had a good mutual kind of like feeling, nice. but at that point, you know, the position had been filled. So there was no opportunity uh, moving forward until two and a half years later. So I stayed in touch with Louise and um, just kind of building that rapport, huh? Yeah, and, and you know, sort of <laughs> building that relationship without really, you know, obviously I was hoping to get a job with her eventually, but after a year, a year and a half, that wasn't really my priority anymore. She's just this amazing designer and is is really a, 
a sort of living legend of, of our, 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 in, our lettering industry anyway right. in the city and beyond. So getting to know her and hearing her talk about lettering and how she sort of talks about type and design was, was really the big payoff for me and what made that relationship even before working for her really worth it and really valuable for me. So that, so getting hired by her was just sort of this like pleasant, uh, like the cherry on top, you know, after, after knowing her for that uh, long. Yeah. After that actually kind of getting to know her and then actually being able to work mm-hmm. for her. I mean, it's just funny. And how I think that's partially why, really... oh, sorry. Well, no, I was just saying, it's just funny how some of the, sometimes those things work. Yeah. And I think that's why we had, uh, I feel like we had such a good working relationship because we were sort of pretty familiar and comfortable with each other even before I started there. Okay. So let's talk about this um, <clears throat> this style that you've basically patented. Um, yeah. <laughs> fo- fo- fosaic. Fosaics, yeah. Right. So it's fosaic. A, it, it's a... It's a portmanteau of, of faux and mosaics. And I started it really, it's hard. To, I mean, it kind of comes out of this period we were talking about a second ago where I was bored by my personal work and kind of just overall feeling, like not feeling lettering and not feeling design anymore. Mm. I thought that by that point, I it was I should just abandon design and st- find something else. So I looked into going to back to school for interior design, and ended up not pursuing it. But um, I got really into it for a little while. Read up a lot about you know stuff like lighting fixtures and eventually tiles and tiling patterns came mm. up also. So and and as I mentioned earlier, decorative arts have always been a huge interest of mine. And so that was one big component, I think, that motivated or, or what, one of the sparks of the series, I guess. And then the other one was that Louise publishes these sign books. Uh, she goes to a different European city and she takes all these pictures of vintage signs and some of them are mosaic. So I spent a lot of time photoshopping these these pictures for her to be published in these books. Okay. So I got to observe mosaics really, really closely for a long, long time for, you know, months at a time. So that kind of familiarity with how they were put together by just observing them for so long and Photoshopping them and fixing them up. Uh, sometimes, you know, there would be scaffolding in front of a particular mosaic. So I would have to remove the scaffolding Aww. and rebuild the mosaic behind it, you know, that sort of stuff. And eventually it seemed, you know, I wanted to try out making one from scratch and, uh, I, I did, and it came pretty naturally, and, and it seemed like this really nice convergence of these these three things I really love. So, you know, interior design and lettering and decorative art kind of all came together with, with this project. So I, I really enjoyed it, and then uh, sort of put it aside for a little while, then officially launched it as a series in April of this year, so it's about six months old at this point, and have been going pretty much ever since you know it's it's kind of had this interest interesting I guess uh sort of lifespan where it started off very like it it became popular rather quickly like Mm -hmm. surprisingly quickly for me I think I wasn't expecting it and now I'm kind of starting to think about you know what where's where is this gonna go like how does this fit in my life longer term does it or you know because really it was it was never meant to be anything more than a a personal project and I must confess like I didn't know prior to because that's how I found out about you but I didn't know that it was all like photoshop stuff yeah like I thought it was like just real tile and I'm like how is this happening so often Right. I'm just trying to I figure it out and I saw Scotty Scotty yeah. said something about it. I'm just like um Eric, Eric Friedison. I saw Eric oh, yeah. Friedison say something about yeah. it. And I was like Ash dot. Yeah, so then I started looking into it and I was like, Oh <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. 
Yeah, it's it's funny to hear like what people think because I though I've never been secretive about the fact that they're not real. You know, faux is in the name itself, but a lot of people think that they're real, so they'll like every time I post one I'll get a question like, Oh, where where is this? I'm I'm visiting San Diego or whatever <laughs> next week. Like, where can I find this mosaic? I wanna take a picture. And uh, <laughs> you come with the disappointment. <laughs> yeah, and I'm like, well, actually, you know, it's not real, and I feel bad because I feel like I've been deceiving them, but like I've, I've never really hidden that fact. No, nah, but I think so, that's kind of like the draw factor too. A part of it, because somebody just randomly finding it, I mean, it sh- it looks realistic, and it basically outside of design, like it draw anyone. Like, I know it would draw my wife. Thank you. I appreciate I appreciate that. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know why. Like, I don't know if it's just the realism or the fact that it, they look like they take forever. If that kind of has, like, that added, like, draw yeah. of that kind of meticulousness, uh, which, which they do take forever. Uh, I'm not entirely sure. Or if it's, you know, also it's just kind of like eye candy, you know. But I had someone contact me and was like, I don't understand if you make these or you just is it your job to travel and look for like floors <laughs> so <laughs> oh gosh that is funny i mean it would be it would I, I, yeah it would be pretty amazing if if just the the world was littered with interest interesting uh hey man you just never eggs. know like what what it what it can turn into but i mean it's pretty cool yeah and it's taking it's taking some interesting twists and turns because it's it because I never really thought of it as a commercially viable personal project. Uh, I just did it because I wanted to do something creative that also has kind of a repetitive, meticulous quality, sort of like like knitting or something that's like kind of meditative in a certain right, way. You right, know, I was right. doing that and I was enjoying this this kind of zone I was getting in as I was drawing, you know, each one is about like six to 10,000 tiles. So that's a lot of drawing. Um, Yeah. So, but because I never really thought of it as a commercially viable piece or a project, it's interesting to me to see how clients are applying it to their own needs. So I, I, obviously the, the kind of the, the obvious application, would be for editorial stuff so I I have gotten quite a few magazine covers and and stuff like that Uh, but increasingly I'm getting sort of more creative requests like I've I've been asked to do to do one pretty recently actually just sent it to print the other day that is going to be print life-size it's still going to be fake it'll be printed on vinyl but it's going to be printed life-size and be this temporary installation at this store on um, downtown Manhattan. Nice. Uh, so, yeah, so, so that's, it's interesting. I don't know how it's going to look. I'm hoping it's going to look good because I don't want them to be angry at me if it doesn't. But, um, you know, I, I was... <laughs> no, you do like, fine, I don't, man. It's going I don't know fine. how this is going to look. But also uh, another clothing uh, store here in the city wanted me to do a real mosaic, which was absolutely, you know, I don't know how to do that. So I had to you know, research mosaic artisans in Manhattan, which is not, not easy, I guess. I could only find one couple. I'm it's like really old. You like, even found any. Yeah. And the only ones that like look like they were really like legit, like professional mosaic artists. And they were like, they agreed to do it, but they were like, why do we need you? Like, why do we need you to do the type? We can just, just do the type. And <laughs> I was like, well, I'm, I want to letter it in a certain way. And, you know, the <laughs> client wants my type. I just need you to make it in, in tiles. Um, but yeah, it's been, it's been an interesting ride for sure. That's pretty cool. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I just kind of see it kind of going into something like that, but I mean, it was, I was just like, and then <clears throat> I, I saw my friend, um, Ray, I know you saw it too. Ray did his version Oh yeah, yeah, that was ago. that was cool. Yeah, I love yeah. seeing stuff like that. Like, so, I really like it when people sort of, um, when people do their own interpretations of it. So, so I'm not cool. even sure if it's like the same process for you, but just taking a peek into his process, it's just like mm-hmm. this thing is intense, man. 
Yeah, yeah, and I, I have gotten like several requests for tutorials and teaching, and I'm doing a little bit. I'm just starting to get into it now, um, and I've never, I don't really talk about it much, and it's not because I'm being secretive or protective. It's just because there's not much to it. Like the process is pretty much what it looks like. You know, you draw the tiles one by one, and uh, it takes a long time. But there's really no there's no other trick or technique, you know. Oh, yeah. Obviously, there are small improvements I've made to, like, streamline the process for myself now that oh. I've made a few of them. But um, it's it's I'm always afraid that people are going to be disappointed if I, like, tell them, you know, how, how it's made. It's pretty simple. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I'm pretty sure just drawing, I mean, it's, it should be a decent, like, how long does it usually take you to, like... Like the Austin one, how long did that take? Uh, the Austin one, the Austin one was a collab actually okay. with Mark Caneso. Okay. Um, so, but that doesn't really change the the amount of time it takes for for tiling the the hand drawing the the grout that the tiles you know fit around and it depends. You know, the Austin one was actually it has some larger tiles around the, the edge. Okay. So those take less because there's less grout to draw. Right. But a piece like I, I published, uh, I posted this one for Paris not too long ago. Mm -hmm. I've seen that and one. that one has tons of like the, the tiles are pretty small. I don't know why I made them so small, but that one took a solid 24 hours of just um, just drawing. That's crazy. Just grouting. Yeah. So that was one of the longest ones in the the newest one that I did that was gonna, that's going to be printed full size, that one is probably takes the cake as like the longest one just because I wanted it to look really good at 100% size. Right. I'm generally not as concerned with with like making each individual tile look, you know, good. Uh, but in this case, I wanted to make it look uh, solid. Yeah, plus, it's for a client through. and all of that stuff. So you, know, right, you got to yeah. put the extra you know, oomph on it. Sure, for sure. Right, Bells right, and whistles right. and all. So... I like this whole deal that you're doing with going independent and you're like counting the days, um, mm -hmm. like day one, day two, day three. I mean, it's yeah. pretty cool. Like I'm pushing real hard right now to go independent, but I'm not quite there yet. So, awesome. I mean, I just kind of want to hear like what made you want to go independent and how it's going so far. Yeah. So it's, it's pretty recent, uh, still it's, I'm on, uh, like day 70 something now and I, I I'm I'm loving it the push was mostly just this this feeling that I, I was I was getting a, a decent amount of freelance work on the side and that ended up I was I was making pretty much the same amount of money I was making freelance on my day job so which obviously it's great to have two incomes but it was, I had no, you know, work-life balance. I'd get home from work, I'd do more work, and I'd do work on the weekends, and uh, and I'd, I'd inevitably burn out once every, like, month and a half or two months, so then I, I'd, i like, not be able to do any work for two weeks mm -hmm. and then start the cycle again. It's just not, not a healthy way to relate to, to your own work. So it just, it just sort of, that was part of the impetus. The other part was that uh, my my partner was applying to go to graduate school in London, so that would have required a move, and uh, it ended up not working out for us. Uh, the move, I mean, but I still I had I had already given notice by that point, and oh. arrangements were already made. So, but it, it all worked out. You know, it all worked out for the best. Now, so the ball so, was already rolling. So the yeah. ball was rolling. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, but it's good. You know, my work-life balance isn't really any better, honestly, right now. <laughs> like, uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I still work just as much. Uh, I I feel like if there's a void of time, then work is just going to fill it automatically, regardless of how much how much time you have. And I'm actually right now in the process of trying to be a bit more intentional about the work I take on right. and just in general, how I live my life, just living a little bit more intentionally and not just taking everything that comes my way just because I'm afraid I'm not going to have, you know, 
I'm not going to have work next month if I don't take every single thing. So gotcha. Um, gotcha. I'm still on the tail end of this, like taking everything. So I'm a little bit frazzled at the moment, but I think moving forward, I'd like to be a bit more sort of considered, like consider a little bit more what, what I take on. So what would you, what, what's your secret, man? Like, how are you just like so overloaded with work? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, um, I, I mean, I, I, it's not all, it's not all like interesting work. Like it's not all like glamorous stuff I share on Instagram. You know? I think, I, not think, that that's glamorous, I think people don't but... really, people, when, when you get, most of the times that's how it is though. Like the boring it's work life, is what, you know? the like, boring work is what kind of keeps you, go, keeps you afloat. Yeah. <laughs> and you share the work you want to do more of, you know, right. I'm not going to share the work I hate doing because right. I don't want to get more of that work. Exactly. But, um, but yeah, there is some work that I, I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to say specifically just in case one of my clients is listening. But uh, there is some work I'm less excited about. Some work that maybe I was excited about two years ago. You know, the idea of doing a certain type of work excited me, and now I've kind of either outgrown it or just moved on. But I still kind of take those jobs just by nature of habit. Or because I'm I'm afraid of losing those relationships with art directors, and right. um, I have a hard time saying no. But I think that's uh, that's a common struggle for a lot of us. Um, yes, yes, indeed. just being yeah, yeah. So, but some work is exciting and is interesting, and just trying to downsize I, I think is also great because right now I I don't I don't want to tackle those projects I'm excited about in kind of a frazzled way. I want to have time to really do something that ex- ex- excites me and not just plow through it just because I need to get it done and I'm like a week and a half late. Cool. So what made you, um, I've I seen your post, uh, what made you get um, like an agent? Oh, yeah. Um, I, well, I, I was having coffee with a friend of mine, Becca, and she mentioned having an agent and she was kind enough to offer uh to just bring me up to her agent and uh even though that's not the agent I eventually signed with it still got me thinking about representation and what that could do and how that could help and mostly I'm just terrible at pricing my own work Mm. Um, and that not I'm not saying that I chronically undercharge sometimes I undercharge sometimes I overcharge I just don't know what's appropriate sometimes just you know larger advertising budgets with licensing it's it's just it it's hard com- to ask for it's yeah it's pretty complex it's complicated and uh, I just I, I didn't enjoy that process this that guesswork because um, I, I didn't want to just pull a number out of out of a hat that maybe, you know, this was, this was, especially for smaller clients, this is like a number that they have to work towards and they have to save and budget for. And, you know, I don't want to feel like I'm overcharging these people or, you know, but at the same time, I don't want to undervalue myself and also right. the rest of the industry by, by undercharging. So, uh, so that was my primary, the primary impetus for, for getting an agent. Also just, just getting, I think I'm trying to like transition from like oh I'm do- I have a full time job I'm doing this on the side to like this is my job so I'm I'm trying to like tighten up my ship um, across the board so getting an agent was part of that endeavor cool. just just also learning how the agent relates to the clients the type of language she uses the type of contracts she writes just I'm trying to think of it kind of as like a a learning experience for me. I don't know how long I'm going to stay with an agent, but I'm hoping to that by that by the time I decide to leave, if I decide to leave, I, I'll have absorbed enough information that uh, I'll be able to, or at least I'll be a little bit more confident doing this on my own. Cool, man. Cool. I mean, um, I, I, I'm, I wouldn't see why not. I mean, might as well just kind of explore all the avenues. This, sure. This is the experimental time for you anyways. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I think it's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, so, I'm ex- I'm excited about it. So, um go you're you're now 100% independent. You have an agent, yep. right? Yeah. Um what's next? What's next for Nick? 
What's what, um, what's on the horizon? What do you see yeah. down the road? Yeah, that's um, surprisingly difficult to answer. You know, I'm. Uh, I feel like this project has put me on a trajectory, and it's been an incredibly. It's been surprising, and I'm so thankful for where this project has taken me. Mm. Um, but at this point, I am. I'm starting to feel the need to move past it and move move beyond just this project. I don't want to be the mosaic guy for very much longer. Uh, and it's it's been it's been great, but it's obviously time intensive. But I I'm noticing as I'm doing the 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 latest ones that it's become less about the process and more about the content. You know, just it's become more about like this is what I'm expected to do. I should be publishing these at a at a regular sort of interval so that I can, mm. you know, keep the momentum going. And it, it became about that and less about the exploratory quality and the experimental quality that that I was I was really enjoying earlier on. Um, I, yeah, and I, I think that's prim- primarily what where I'm at. I want to find what's next for me in a way that that feels like I'm doing work that's that's meaningful for me and not just motivated by the response it's been getting online. Gotcha. Gotcha. Which is a hard thing. It's like, that's also a battle in itself. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, validation is awesome. It's so nice to, you know, it's, it's helped me grow my audience considerably. So I'm obviously afraid that they'll just all go away when I start (laughs) posting something different or like it went, once I announce that the series is done and it's time for me to move on, you know, they might be like, okay, bye, see ya. Um, <laughs> or maybe I not. I find that very hard to That's believe. I'm pretty sure you're going to... Yeah, it plays into my own like insecurity more. and other issues for another call. Yeah, um, it, it, I think it's just, uh, I mean, you're pretty known. I think it's more the quality. I know, I'm pretty sure, yes, the, um, the, the faux Zeke, you know, created a, a buzz, but I think... At the end of the day, it's quality work. Oh, that's and, nice of you to uh, say. Thank you. It's quality work. So quality work will show up no matter what. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Well, man, um, what what advice? What advice would you have for creatives out there that you know either working for someone independent mm-hmm. right now or working towards being independent? What advice? Would sure. You um, I would mostly urge people to listen to sort of listen to what they're feeling as they're as they're working on something if if that something is boring you if it's frustrating you if you're just trying to like sort of blast through it to get to something else you know just I think listening to those feelings is is pretty important Mm -hmm. and uh it's it's it has served me well in the past even though I don't always do it um also there's, I'm, I'm a big believer in just, uh, in attention to detail, obviously, and we all talk about attention to detail, but, um, just a love of, of craft, uh, is something that I've always felt very strongly about and is something that in grad school was secondary to concept, you know, concept and ideas always take the, like, sort of the main stage and, mm. And you know we're always told, oh, it's it's uh, it's um, form before function, and form is always second, and form is always informed by the concept, which is all true. But I think there's a lot of value in um, exploring form and exploring the mediums, and uh, and also accepting it and being okay if you're if you're just more of a of a form guy like I am like it's it's okay that you know my how I cultivate my craft is through the the study of form and the study of um you know I'm not necessarily exploring um deep concepts in my work um that's not as interesting to me and I think that's that's okay it might be in the future but right now I mean I, I'm just trying to do what I like. Sounds good, man. I mean, um, sounds great. I mean, I do agree with you because, like, even with me, like, 
now I am um, it's one thing to create good work but the next mm-hmm. level is to present that work and I'm just mm-hmm. that's a whole nother thing in itself like you create good work but then to present that work especially to like clients and stuff like that yeah you know I'm really diving deep into that which is a whole nother blogging yeah for sure for sure and I mean also stuff like you know stuff can like through presenting it and through talking about it and through just working on it like other stuff can emerge and like the process kind of evolves on its own um and I think we kind of lose sight of that if we're just like sitting there thinking about thinking about it too much instead of just doing it um and I say that as like an overthinker who like has a hard time just like doing anything and I'm always like thinking that it's not going to be good enough so I just don't do it but like more often than not like I feel like the work that comes as a result of process and as as a result of the exploration that comes with the process is uh tends to be usually more exciting and more dynamic very true well, man, I really appreciate you coming on. This has been a blast. Same um, here. It's been awesome. Thank you for uh, having me. I mean, it, I'm glad you're an easy guy to deal with. I mean, um, th- this has been, I didn't expect you to really um, shoot me back as fast as you did because I know you were getting ready to go to Australia for um Yeah. Oh, no, it's my pleasure. But, um, yeah, th- that was great. Um, thanks again, Nick. I mean, I really my appreciate it. My pleasure. And, you know, when you come back to New York, we'll, like, go get a burger or something. Oh, for sure, man. I'll definitely um, give you a shout when I get back to New York. But, man, I'm yeah. going to let you enjoy the rest of your night. Thanks again. Thank you. Um, Same here. Keep doing what you're doing, man. Uh, Thank you. You too. You're just going to put out epic work. Thank you so much. All right. Blessings, man. Have a good night. Bye bye. You can always connect with me. DP Creates on Instagram or Twitter. If you ever want to have a conversation, ask a question, that's DP Creates at Instagram or Twitter. Thank you for listening to this week's episode. I hope you enjoyed it. I would love to get your feedback, so please leave a review on iTunes and keep sharing the podcast on social media. Be blessed.